Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. It is my privilege now to welcome back David Smith, senior analyst at the Morgan Report and regular contributor to MoneyMetals.com. Well, David, Happy New Year, my friend, and thanks for joining us again. How are you? I'm very good, Mike. Looking forward to a very exciting year. I think we're going to have all sorts of interesting things to be watching and reacting to. Yeah, it certainly looks that way, and uh, we've got lots to talk about today as usual, so I'll, I'll get right into it. Uh, as we're talking here on Thursday morning, David, the metals are pulling back a bit, but both have, have continued to perform well in the early going of 2017. So where are we here in the gold and silver markets? What's driving the positive trading action over the last few weeks, and do you think it's sustainable? There are a lot of conflicting currents out there, and it's trying to make sense of it all can be really difficult. I think what's really important is that people need to have a plan uh, that takes into account the fact that there are a lot of unknowns, but yet if they are a believer in the gold and silver story as we are, uh, they should be accumulating. The simplest thing to do is to just have a dollar cost averaging where you buy a certain amount every month that you've committed to do regardless of the price, because if you try to catch all the squiggles, you really... Uh, amp up your own concerns and make it difficult to make uh, decisions that aren't emotionally driven. And it's also very possible, if not probable, that you miss the longer picture because you're trying to catch the little squiggles rather than realizing that we're in a long-term uptrend that's likely to continue for a number of more years. The setup coming into this year has looked a lot like last year. We're coming off a December rate hike by the Fed, the only one of the year in both cases, 2015 and 2016. A dollar that appeared to be overvalued and, and gold and silver looking quite oversold. And now, last year, we had a fantastic start for the metals and miners. Uh, so how do you see things going this year? Are you looking for a repeat of 2016, David? Well, I think that there's going to be a, a certain similarity to it. Uh, I remember last year, the first couple of weeks, right up into the time that we're talking about now, a year ago, it was really pretty discouraging for the metals and the miners. And I specifically remember on January 19th, which is tomorrow would be a, a direct anniversary of that, uh, it looked like the new lows were going to be made and sustained. But by the close, uh, that had turned out to be a bear trap, and the market uh, firmed up and it never looked back. So I don't know if we'll have as strong of a first five or six months as we did last year, but I think it will be stronger than most people expect. And I think the risk for people that believe in the precious metals is either being out of the market or not having their full allocation rather than having the position because I think there's a tremendous uh, amount of energy that's pushing these metals to the upside, even though we see volatile days like we're looking at today. Certainly sentiment is uh, pretty low right now among the investment world towards precious metals. Many are thinking that there's uh, no reason to, to own precious metals now that we have uh, Donald Trump in the White House, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But uh, what do you have to say about sentiment right now? What's it What's it feel like out there to you? Obviously, you talk a lot in the mining community and the precious metals community as a whole. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of sentiment? Are people cautiously optimistic? Is there just very little buzz uh, happening there? What are you seeing? Well, the sentiment of the people that produce the metals, I think, is much more positive than many of the people in the investing public. And the thing is, as you know, Mike, if you try to base your investment decisions on going with the crowd, you are not going to do too well. You really have to be a contrarian, and it's difficult. It's difficult to buy when you see that a lot of people think the metals are going to go lower. But if you wait until they all feel that they're going to go higher, first of all, uh, the crowd is usually not right on the swings. And secondly, by the time you do that, a lot of the price appreciation that you were looking for is already taking place. So... Sentiment is an indicator, I think, of an opportunity to buy at a better price and a better uh, sustainable situation when you go against that rather than try to flow with it. How about palladium, David? It's It's been uh, outperforming the other precious metals lately, and it, maybe it's now starting to bring gold and silver with it. It was the best performer last year. Uh, now, we've seen this before where palladium leads the, the way among the precious metals. What's behind that correlation, and do you see it happening again here? I think we're looking at something very similar to what happened in late 2013, early 2014, and David Morgan and I both commented on this on a major article that we uh, had that was published in uh, Prospector News where we noticed that and mentioned that uh, palladium oftentimes is a leading-edge 
for gold and silver, they'll follow along a bit later. And after we wrote that article, Palladium managed to surge almost $300 an ounce from where we had been discussing it, and gold and silver were also quite strong. So that may be for different reasons this time, but I think there'll be a similar type of echo effect on that because uh, Palladium is becoming more and more of a situation where you are looking at supply issues and demand, not only from industrial, but also from investors, is ramping up. So even though Palladium is uh, maybe at the towards the top end of a trading range that we've seen for, for several years now, this 750 to $800 level, do you still think there's some value there, or, or maybe is it uh, better to look at some of the other metals over Palladium? Well, obviously it would have been better to buy $100 lower, but the thing is, I think one of the things that the market is not fully discounting is that there's been a very large withdrawal of physical supplies from one of the major ETFs, which indicates that there's demand out there for palladium, which is maybe greater than what the market thinks. So you have the price of the metal itself and the ETF trading about where it was a year or so ago, and yet the supply situation has deteriorated significantly. So I think palladium is going to be one to watch, and I think the possibility of much higher prices for it and then uh, for gold and silver for their own unique reasons uh, is really something that is a high possibility, if not a probability. Switching gears here a moment, it seems the political and banker class would like to escalate the war on cash this year. Eliminating cash has been a popular topic of conversation at the Davos World Economic Forum. The rationale for cracking down on cash always revolves around the idea of making it harder for drug dealers and tax cheaters to operate. None of these people want to discuss the merits of of privacy or the implications for liberty if every transaction can be monitored and controlled by government and their partner banks. In the short run, a war on cash could be very good for precious metals, as owning physical gold and silver is a great alternative to cash. But maybe we'll see officials try to slam the gate shut on people switching to metals. So so do you think they can get away with eliminating and even outlawing cash in the U.S.? And do you see this happening anytime soon? And are, are you looking for any surprises there in the war on cash? Well, the timing on these things is really unpredictable. No one can predict it. I mean, for example, when uh, it was it November that Modi in India decided to outlaw 85% of the cash and have it turned in for a new uh, cash unit? No one really expected that, except for the people in the know, of course, that uh, went ahead and changed their finances ahead of time. But uh, I do think that it's one of those two steps forward, one step back on the part of uh, central governments. They really want to push us into a digital currency, as you mentioned, and the implications for that are profound, and they're all negative because it's the convenience uh, factor that they push that, oh, you know, we won't have to carry dirty cash around. But the point is uh, you lose when you become a digital uh, situation only, you lose all your privacy, you lose your flexibility, and also what's really degrading uh, from a social standpoint is that you have a situation where the implication is that if you're using cash uh, for a transaction or you have it, that you must be a criminal. And so you become guilty until proven innocent rather than innocent or proven guilty. And that really uh, degrades the social contract that governments and citizens have. So uh, I do think we'll see more efforts of that, not only uh, abroad, but also in this country. And people should consider when they talk about eliminating a $100 bill because that's what drug dealers use. I mean, that's really a farcical comment. And the, the sad point is that the $100 bill today has the purchasing power of a $20 bill from the 1960s. So, you know, we're looking at something that even has so much less real value than perceived. Uh, and that certainly has not been the case with precious metals. They have done quite well, and they're going to continue to do well. And I think even if we have a so-called war on gold that you talk about, which could happen at some point, it'll probably take the form of trying to uh, have windfall profits taxed on people who've made more money than they ever expected when the metals go through the roof. And so that's to me, is not something to avoid buying the metals because that could happen, because the gold and silver are the last resources in terms of true money that has gone on for thousands of years, and they've outwitted all the government schemes before, and I think they'll continue to do so in terms of their support by the people. We had Keith Newmeyer from First Majestic Silver on the podcast last week, and we talked about the recent Deutsche Bank settlement for rigging gold and silver prices and the evidence they have turned over, uh, which implicate other big banks. So far, Keith has had trouble recruiting other miners to join him in exposing and criticizing the manipulators. Uh, perhaps people have sort of given up on the idea that anyone can actually hold these banks accountable. The regulators have certainly failed, but but this action in, in civil court might have an impact, and it, it might even 
get some of the regulators to take action as well. Uh, what do you think the chances are for investors in the metals to finally get more honest markets and, and maybe even some justice here? Well, first of all, I really laud what Keith has doing and has attempted to do, and he's been one of the most outspoken in the industry. And I think more of the uh, CEOs are going to come on board with him over time, but you always have to have someone to stand up and get the ball rolling. And I think the biggest effect that we can predict is very predictable, is that we don't know how these court cases are going to end up or if they're going to expand or whatever, but we do know that this is just one more chipping away at the foundation of confidence that people have in their institutions and in the veracity and truth of the financial institutions and the banks. And this sort of thing is just one of of even more revelations that we're going to have in this regard. And so that's the whole thing. People need to understand that confidence is really the only thing that holds all this uh, stuff together. And when people lose confidence in their institutions and in their uh, paper currency in their pocket, this is going to have a very huge effect on the demand for the precious metals. And this is why we're meeting more and more signs of the supply being called into question over the coming years of both gold and silver. People that wait around and think that they'll just take a position when all the ducks have lined up, they're going to be sadly disappointed, I believe. Prices will be much higher, and premiums will be much higher as well, too. So any perceived benefit they're going to get by waiting around for lower prices, I believe, will be more than offset by the increase in premiums and the question of supply. What do you have to say to the guy who just thinks this manipulation in the metals markets can go on forever? I mean, at some point, we do have to have some consequences for suppressed prices in terms of supply, uh, new exploration, correct? Yeah, I understand the, the view that you just expressed, that people would feel a little bit concerned. That could this go on forever? And it seems like they're all powerful. But what I've learned as a student of history is that at great turning points and inflection points in history, uh, when you looked at the evidence that was available at the time and you look back on it, it appeared that the certain forces could never, ever be turned around and that that was the way it was going to go forever. And oftentimes you were looking right at the precise point where that uh, seeming strength was actually a tremendous weakness. And then when things turned around, it happened very quickly. And with our Internet uh, capability for communication and whatnot, it'll be faster than ever. And I think trying to pinpoint this, first of all, none of us can predict when it's going to occur, but it is going to occur. We're going to have a massive breakdown in the system which has been able to defraud investors of billions of dollars over the years. And when it does happen, it will happen very quickly, and we'll wake up one morning and everything will be different. But if we haven't prepared for it, we're going to be just watching rather than be able to participate. We'll be forced to react. So I do think that uh, people just need to hang in there, and we're not going to be having this conversation too much farther down the line before things have changed in a fundamental way. And uh, it will be too late for people that have continued to wait when the evidence is on the table. Lots of metals investors would like to know what a Donald Trump presidency will mean for metals prices in the months ahead. He's going to be inaugurated here uh, tomorrow. We're speaking on Thursday. I I've been asking this question to nearly every guest we've had on for the last couple of months. In our opinion, it's just very hard to predict. Uh, for example, he was quite critical of the Fed and artificially low interest rates at times, but he has also said he sees low interest rates as an opportunity for the government to borrow a lot of money cheaply, and it doesn't look like he has any issue anymore with Janet Yellen heading up the Fed. Uh, so what do you think a Trump presidency uh, will have in terms of an impact on the metals markets, David? I think it will have massive volatility. And, you know, there's something to consider, too. It, it's beyond what would Trump like to do or what does he say he's going to do, this type of thing, what's his philosophy. That's one side of the teeter-totter, but the other side is what is he going to be able to do? And there's so many forces out there uh, that are arrayed against what he wants to do, and there are others that are for it. And that tug-of-war is going to be taking place not only uh, in the uh, public opinion, but also in the back rooms. And how that plays out is anybody's guess. But I'll tell you one thing, I would feel very uncomfortable not having a position in the medals to going forward with all the uncertainty that we're having, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, because uh, it's almost an order of magnitude more than anything I've ever seen in my life. And anybody that thinks they can tease out the details and be predictive about how that outcome is going to be, I think is uh, taking a lot upon themselves that they're not going to be able to do. So watching once you've already come up with your plan and you've executed your plan, I think is the way to go, rather than to try to anticipate 
and be way behind the curve when things do happen. Furthering the point there, uh, as we mentioned, gold and silver have looked good here in the first few weeks of the year, David. Uh, now, as we begin to close, uh, give the precious metals investing audience out there your thoughts on the idea of waiting for, you know, quote, a safe price to buy versus uh, taking a position in, in physical metals and continuing to dollar cost average. Basically, what is your advice for folks? Because you've always had great level-headed insight on the subject of not letting your emotions get the best of you when it comes to investing. Give us your thoughts there. Well, you know, Mike, there are two types of risk in investing. There's information risk where you don't know all the information and no one ever does until something happens. And when there's information risk, then the the price tends to be low, quote, in the relationship to when all the information is known or most of it. And so right now we have information risk. We don't know how things are going to play out with the early days, months, and weeks of the, the of a Trump presidency, and we don't know – uh, how he'll be able to work whatever magic he's trying to do and what the response will be. So prices are under pressure as we speak. But when it becomes cl- more clearly known, uh, what, whatever implications that that brings, uh, and if that is uh, very positive for precious metals, and, and so therefore more information is in the market, the price will be substantially higher. And so uh, you, if you want to wait for price risk when prices are higher, you go, oh, okay, it's safe now, I'll go in you've given up a lot of the potential for price appreciation. And so you have to take a risk. And being out of the market is just as big a risk as being in it. So when you you look at where prices are, where they have been, uh, and inflation-adjusted terms also, the prices in here are really reasonable compared to what they probably will be in the reasonably near future. So I think the risk-reward is very good. And the nice thing about it, Mike, you know, again, we've always talked about this, the idea of uh, deciding how much you want to contribute to your metals purchase and then buying in tranches. So buy one-third right now if you've decided to do that and then attempt to buy a third on lower prices. And, and, and that works very, very well because then you're hoping for lower prices and you turn that psychological tool on its head to your benefit. Another way is to dollar cost average, and that takes so much, much emotion out of the market. And we're all emotional creatures, you know, but you've got to keep it under control. And if you say, I'm going to uh, devote X amount of dollars every month, the price for the next six months, no matter what that price is. You've got your plan. You, you put it in motion, and every month you buy your metals. And you just don't worry about the price. You just do it. And that sort of thing makes you uh, able to remain calm, and you can have marvelous results when you look back on it rather than trying to guess the market. So I've heard so many people on these chat rooms talking, oh, if the price of silver goes uh, down a dollar, then I'll buy And it gets down a dollar, and inevitably they don't buy. They go, well, it could go lower. And so they carry this thing out, and the next thing you know, six months later it's $5 higher, and they still haven't bought anything. So, you know, you've got to have a plan, and then you've got to follow that plan. Otherwise, you're just going to be watching. And finally, do you have any price targets for gold and silver this year and any other uh, closing comments that you want to share with us before we wrap up? Well, I think uh, a big thing is going to be seeing how silver deals with 21 and $22, which is where it topped out last year. See if it uh, is able to chew through that. And if it does, the next target will be 26 And that uh, I've said for years that that is a huge, huge target. And if, if and when the silver can get above $26 and form a platform, then it's really going to be fascinating to watch how it deals with the uh, space between 26 and 50 and, of course, gold would probably be 1450 1500 area. That would be an analogous to the gold price. So I, I'm really fascinated to watch this and rather try to predict when it will happen. I believe it will happen. And uh, I think it's important that people round off their positions and then just sit back and watch rather than to try to look at all the little squiggles and then end up uh, not having a position. Well, David, thanks so much for sharing your comments and your wisdom with us once again. We always appreciate your time and your excellent insights. And uh, Now, before we close, uh, give us a few words on the new book that you and David Morgan finished up late last year titled Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. Well, you know, Mike, we're very gratified by not only the public response but the professional response to our book. And we think the timing is good and... uh, We believe that this is really an opportunity for people to come up with a plan and we discuss how to put that together in a way that works for the individual and then go out and execute that plan. And we believe the potential is going to be absolutely enormous over the next few years as we go into that third 
and final secular leg of the bull market, which uh, could run three or four or five years or even longer, but it's going to last several years. And if you approach it intelligently and if you've done your own homework and then get gotten into the market, I think you're going to do very, very well. And one of the things, there are two kind of subtopics that we talk about that I think are very important. One is uh, creating balance in your life as you're doing this so that you don't become like J. Paul Getty, who became a billionaire but had no uh, family uh, relationship or the other name for, for his own son, and, and he missed that opportunity to live that part of his life. So we, we try to help people look at in, inwardly as well as outwardly so that while they're doing this and hopefully doing very well for themselves, they also don't forget about the other things in life which lead to a balanced life. The other thing, which, uh, frankly, I've never seen anyone deal with in any kind of a concerted fashion in the writing, is how to keep the money that you make. And so people, uh, the public, tend to ride these booms all the way up and then all the way down, rather than have a plan to uh, sell some of their earnings uh, for really large profits and not keep them continually at risk. So we spend quite a bit of the time in the book discussing how that can happen. We have a, a unique plan uh, that you can do, that once you've looked at the intellectual aspect of it, then you tie that into your emotional aspect, and then you put together something that has a very good chance of success. And so we're excited to have this book out there, and, and we think it's going to be one that is going to be relevant to people uh, for the next several years as they compare things with their own position. So we're very excited to get it out there, and uh, we're very happy uh, to see the response we're getting. Yeah, great stuff, David, and uh, definitely continued success to you and David Morgan there on, on the book. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, how that continues to go. And uh, look forward to our next conversation as well, and I hope you have a great weekend. Take care, my friend. Okay, bye-bye now. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Smith, senior analyst at The Morgan Report and regular columnist for MoneyMetals.com and now co-author of the new book, Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave, which is available at MoneyMetals.com and Amazon. Pick up a copy today. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.